interim. Interim, mm -hmm. darn. Mm -hmm. uh, director of the Wisconsin Election Commission and Richard Rydecki, Director of uh, Election Administration. What's your title? Sure. I'm the Assistant Administ Assist Administrator, for technically. The Assistant Administrator, technically. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I'll just turn it over to you guys. Well, thank you so much, and thank you so much for having us. Uh, we're glad to be here. Um, I think that uh, this is, it, it's exciting to have a group of people that are interested to know sort of the ins and outs of our voter registration system. Uh, like Karen mentioned, uh, we're very proud of our system, and we think that it is um, a really strong model uh, for how voter registration systems can work across the country. Um, and I also think that it's important to kind of paint a picture of how election security in Wisconsin overall works uh, and then show you sort of how the statewide voter registration system fits into that larger picture um, because a lot of times it's hard to isolate just that topic on its own. Um, so before we get started, uh, we just wanted to talk a little bit about how elections are administered here in the state of Wisconsin. Um, first of all, we're here from the State Elections Commission and um, we are an independent agency of the state. Um, so we're charged with the oversight of elections administration for the state of Wisconsin. We're overseen by a bipartisan board of a six member commission. And then we have uh, staff in our office that focuses on two major areas. Uh, one is technical side of things, the statewide voter registration system, and some of the other things that we'll talk about. And the other is more of our policy uh, folks, people working on manuals and trainings, um, documentation, uh, that kind of thing for administering elections. Um, so Wisconsin operates elections very differently uh, than other states. So before we jump into exactly how the statewide system works and the different components, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we run elections here in the state of Wisconsin and how it's different than other states. Uh, so at the state level, there's three levels of government that are really involved in administering elections here in Wisconsin, uh, the state, the county, and the municipality. At the state level, at the State Elections Commission, we're the ones charged with building and maintaining uh, the technology that's used to support elections in the state of Wisconsin. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about our statewide voter registration system, which is called WISVOTE, and that's an end-to-end -end election management system that all of our clerks around the state, our local election officials, use um, in order to administer elections. Uh, so that's everything from when a candidate files their nomination papers uh, through voter registration, absentee, recording participation, building a poll book, all that happens in the statewide system. Uh, we also have related applications uh, that draw information from that system. Uh, one is our electronic poll books, which we also built in-house. Um, and then we have our My Vote Wisconsin uh, website, which is the public-facing portal uh, where voters can go and see their sample ballot, register to vote online. Um, anything a voter needs to know uh, can be found on that site. We also build and maintain of other uh, related applications. Uh, we have an agency website, so anybody that's interested in our, our, our fine memos that we draft at the Elections Commission or the communications we make available to our local election officials, that's more or less our informational website uh, with our manuals and forms and documentations is elections.wi.gov. Uh, we also have Badger Voters. Uh, Badger Voters is where people can go to buy voter lists, um, other voter data uh, that's available. Um, we have that as well. Then we have bringit.wi.gov, and that is a photo ID specific website. So that's where you can find all the voter materials, videos, uh, radio commercials, anything you ever wanted to know about the photo ID law specifically um, if you're working on outreach efforts there. Um, and then we have also some other related systems like our election night reporting system uh, where some of our clerks put their unofficial results in and ultimately use that system uh, to build a report to certify their elections. Uh, at the state level, we also provide training to the counties and the municipalities. Uh, that's one of our really fundamental duties, as well as developing manuals, guidance, forms, and documentations. Uh, we also certify the tabulation systems. Um, so voting systems that are used to tabulate ballots here in Wisconsin have to go through a federal and a state certification process. Uh, some of our other claims to fame here in Wisconsin is we are the most decentralized election administration uh, setup in the entire country, and I'll talk about why that is. 
Uh, we, all, we have about 4.2 million eligible voters here in the state of Wisconsin, and we consider those all to be our customers here uh, at the Elections Commission in addition to our clerks. Uh, we also have really high turnout here in the state of Wisconsin, as you might know. Um, we're historically one of the top five states uh, in terms of turnout in the nation. Um, and as uh, I think is an important point we'll get to a little bit later, is we develop all of our technology in-house uh, at, at the State of Wisconsin Elections Commission, and that isn't standard practice of most other states. All right, so next we have the county level. So in most other states, the county level is where a lot of the election administration actually happens. Uh, but here in the state of Wisconsin, the counties actually play a very limited role uh, in the administration of elections. Uh, the counties do have some statutory responsibilities. They design and they distribute the ballots to the municipalities. Uh, they also are required to display the unofficial election night results uh, for the municipalities on their websites. Um, and they also conduct what's called the County Board of Canvas, uh, which is part of the process to certify results um, after an election. Uh, some of our counties, they will actually uh, serve as sort of a provider for municipalities uh, for using some of the statewide technology. So some really small municipalities might not have the capacity uh, to be able to use some of the, the technical systems and they might pay the county to do some of that work on their behalf. Uh, so some of them can play that role. Uh, some also serve as trainers. Um, so some will train the municipalities in their, munis in their area uh, on certain election administration topics. And then some also play a role in procuring and programming the tabulation voting equipment uh, for their municipalities as well. And our counties vary uh, greatly in size, just like our municipalities. Uh, our smallest county is Men Menominee County, and our largest is Milwaukee. And you can see there's very different uh, sort of populations and resources available uh, in those counties. And we have 72 of them. So most other states, again, they operate at the county level, so they might have 50 to maybe 100 county election officials. Here in the state of Wisconsin, we don't administer elections at the county level, we do it at the municipal level. Uh, and that means we have 1,853 uh, municipal election clerks uh, that administer elections for their city, town, or their village. Uh, so again, that is very different than other states who might have 50 to 100 clerks that they need to train and support technology for. Uh, we have almost 2,000 uh, between those cities, towns, villages, and counties. Um, and so that ends up being a major part of our role at the state is providing support to those 2,000 people um, leading up to Election Day on Election Day. Um, so at the municipal level, um, again, each of those 1,853 city, town, or village clerks are the, the election official for their municipality. Uh, so each of them administer elections for their municipality. Uh, each of those clerks is responsible for training their poll workers. Uh, poll worker training does not happen at the state level. Um, that is actually a responsibility of each individual clerk. Uh, they're also responsible for using the statewide voter registration system. Uh, so those municipal clerks are statutorily required to do things like track their voter registrations, track their absentee ballots in the statewide system. Um, and very few of them have any sort of IT support. Um, so a lot of times at the state, we sort of serve in a role to bridge that gap uh, with those municip municipalities. I was just at a town clerk association meeting and there were 350 of our town clerks in the audience. And I asked them, how many of you have any kind of IT support? And a single hand in that entire audience went up. And so that kind of shows you how limited their IT resources can be in some of these smaller jurisdictions. Uh, a few other facts about our municipalities. Um, so if you were to take all of the local election officials from across the entire country uh, and put them into one room, a fifth of them would be from Wisconsin. I know it says a sixth, but it's closer to a fifth of them would be from Wisconsin. So that's how many we have. Um, of those 1,853 clerks, uh, a third of them turn over every single year. So every single year we have a brand new pool of a third of those clerks that are just coming into elections. Um, and also two thirds of them work part time. So two thirds of them uh, have another full time job and then they serve as a clerk uh, part time, maybe five hours a week for their township uh, for a very minimal sum of money. 
Um, our local election jurisdictions also vary widely uh, in terms of size. Uh, so we have the city of Milwaukee, who has about 600,000 uh, in population. And then we have some of our really small townships. One of them we reference here, the town of Cedar Rapids, has a population of 37. It doesn't matter if you're Milwaukee or a township, you still have to know all the election laws and you have to be able to train your poll workers and run a polling place regardless of the resources you have available to you. So this is really where elections sort of happens in Wisconsin is at the municipal level. Um, in addition to those 1,853 clerks, we have about 30,000 poll workers uh, during a general election. Um, so that's a lot of people to make sure that they know what they need to to administer elections. How many uh, poll workers do we have here today? Usually I'm guessing there's quite a few. All right. Well, that's great. Well, thank you all for your, your service, and I'm sure some of this will, will be information you're already familiar with. So moving on from the municipal level, next I wanted to talk a little bit about now that you kind of understand what the landscape is like in terms of how we administer elections here in Wisconsin, what is our approach to election security? Um, election security has been a really big topic over the course of it, especially the last three years, and has been something that's become a, uh, an absolute priority in our office and across the country as well. And so we have a couple of overarching sort of approaches to election security. And I think um, rather than just talking about the statewide system alone, I wanted to explain sort of how that fits in to the larger picture of election security too. Uh, so when it comes to election security, I like to think of it as having sort of three prongs. Uh, the first is voting equipment and election results verification. So that's at the polling place, the actual results of the election, uh, securing the voting equipment, making sure that people feel confident uh, in the tabulation of the, the vote. The next is a statewide voter registration database. Um, so that, again, is the system that sort of makes elections work behind the scenes, uh, where voter registration and absentee and everything happen is in that statewide system. And then I think the third is an incredibly important piece of it, too, because it plays into the other prongs as well. And that's training our local election officials, uh, making sure that they have a baseline understanding of security, and also making sure that we have public information available about the process so that people can feel confident uh, in how elections are administered here in Wisconsin. And we also have some new funds available to us at the state of Wisconsin for helping us secure elections. And we developed an approach uh, to spending those funds as well. So the Help America Vote Act, uh, this was passed in 2003 and gave states money. Uh, it really came at the time when states were going from those uh, lever machines and we had hanging chads and all that was happening uh, to make sure that states had the tools to upgrade uh, elections technology. And so um, that part of funds is pretty much been expended in all of the states and Congress passed some new additional funds uh, for the Help America Vote Act but they specified that they had to be used for election security. Uh, so at, in the middle of last year the state of Wisconsin received about seven million dollars specifically for election security. Uh, when we received those funds we developed a two-phase approach uh, to how we were going to uh, look at spending those. The first was, what were our immediate needs uh, in 2018 to make sure that we were securing our system? Um, and I'll talk about some of the accomplishments that we were able uh, to do with those funds leading up to the 2018 general election. Uh, but some of those things included staffing. Um, in the last budget cycle, our uh, staff had been um, uh, six positions had been eliminated from our staff and so this funding allowed us to replace those positions uh, with those federal funds so that we have the staff at the state uh, in order to support the systems that we build and maintain um, and then we also made some technical changes to our statewide system now we're in the second phase of our spending plan which is to solicit p feedback from local election officials and from the public. Um, so one of the things that we did even starting in 2018 is we put out a call for feedback from the public uh, with surveys, press releases, asking what people wanted to see in terms of what would make them feel more confident in the process. And now we're also working directly with those local election officials to try to understand what are some of the gaps of resources that they have at the local level and how can we help them address those. Um, and so that's where we are right now is in the second phase of figuring out what else we can do uh, to secure elections with those remaining grant funds. I have a question. Of that $7 million, was it sufficient? 
Yes. Oh, the question was, was the $7 million sufficient for election security? And I think that that's an important question uh, because anything that we look at doing right now, we always have to think about, can we sustain that, right? Um, if we're to do something uh, with election security today, we have to think about, will we have the funds to do that in the future? And so I think that that helps us to secure elections as we head into 2020, but we'll certainly need additional funds beyond 2020 uh, and beyond the terms of this grant, uh, which is five years, uh, to secure elections into the future. And so our hope is that that we will have additional funding, more sustained funding, uh, funding as we head into the future. And I think too, it's important to, to note, and it's a great question, um, and it, it's also it all depends on what your your goals were, what your anticipated goals were for that money. So if if you thought that the state or the municipalities or the counties need enough money to be able to replace their aging voting equipment with a brand new, more modern system. Uh, then the answer is no, $7 million is not going to cover all those costs. But if you're looking for you know, the state to make improvements and to provide increased security for the statewide voter registration database, provide increased training for our local election officials, uh, and then also look at implementing other election um, security programs, sure, I think that we have a significant amount of resources to do that. But it's not a, enough money to cover all of the things on the punch list that I think everyone would like to see happen. So the first prong we have with election security is voting equipment. Um, and I think one of the most important things to talk about with voting equipment right from the offset is here in the state of Wisconsin, every single ballot that's cast has a paper audit trail every single one. That's not the case in every state, uh, although they are working on upgrading those in a lot of states using those funds. Um, but like you referenced, we have a couple of different types of voting equipment uh, in use here in the state of Wisconsin. 85% of the ballots cast here in the state of Wisconsin are cast on a paper ballot where someone fills it out and then they put it through an optical scan tabulator. Then we have about 10% of our ballots that are cast on a direct recording electronic machine, and that's the one that you referenced. That's where you make your selections on the screen, uh, but even though you make your selections on the screen, there's still a paper audit trail. Um, it, it looks a little bit more like a receipt than it does a full paper ballot, but you can check that paper trail to make sure that your ballot was cast in the way that you intended. And in the case of a recount, uh, you would be able to pull those paper tapes to compare them against how the machine tabulated it. Yeah, every single ballot in the state of Wisconsin has that paper trail um, and you know it, it, it should operate uh, so that you will have that available in the case of a recount. And then 5% of the ballots cast are cast just on paper. Uh, they actually don't use electronic machines. And even though that's only 5% of the ballots cast, that's actually close to 800 of our municipalities, those really small municipalities uh, that use that process. All right, so another uh, piece about the voting equipment um, is the voting equipment has to be um, audited before each election and then some of it has to be audited after each election. So before each election there is a logic and accuracy test uh, done by the municipalities on the voting equipment to make sure that it is tabulating votes in the way that is intended. Then the statutes also require that after each general election uh, that randomly selected pieces of voting equipment um, also be audited to make sure that the, the voting equipment did uh, actually tabulate the results as intended. Um, in 2018, our commission actually voted to expand that program. Uh, so the statutes require that at least 100 pieces of randomly selected voting equipment be audited. Uh, the commission chose to increase that to nearly 300 pieces of equipment in 2018. We just released our report on those findings, and we did not find any um, issues across the state in terms of how those machines are functioning. Yes, so part of, part of the audit was that at least uh, there had to be a piece of equipment that was chosen from each county as well um, as part of those nearly 300 that were audited uh, too. We've also been piloting some additional optional audit options for our county and municipal clerks uh, that they can basically uh, hand recount a randomly selected reporting unit uh, again to make sure uh, that the, the totals are correct. And so some of our counties did choose to utilize that process in 2018 um, as an additional double check to make sure uh, that their tabulation was, was correct. 
Um, and we're also considering some future audit programs. So we just brought a proposal to our commission at their meeting in March, um, asking them for permission to move forward with exploring some additional options, things like what we call process audits, uh, where is, uh, you'd maybe go into a municipality, take a look at how they're conducting things, and give them a list of recommendations and best practices that they can use to improve. And so those are some of the things that we will be exploring um, as we head into 2020. Uh, also, I think it's important to point out, like we referenced a little earlier, that the election night results are unofficial. Uh, so those results that you see displayed on the TV on election night, those are unofficial. Uh, so before results can be certified and are actually official, they have to go through three levels of certification. Uh, so the first is the Municipal Board of Canvas, and they usually meet right after the election to go through all of the election materials and try to identify if there are issues um, and certify those results. Uh, they then kick those uh, results to the county to do the same thing, to take a look um, at that process and make sure that everything checks out. And then finally, they're sent to the state um, and we will certify those results uh, unless we were to find something where we needed to kick it back uh, down to a lower level. Um, and so those three steps have to happen before the results are certified. A lot of times that happens about a month after a general election. And I don't think that people, a lot of, you may know because you've worked at the polls and been involved, but a lot of people don't realize it takes that much time before we actually have an official result of an election. So um, I just want to speak a little bit about the process audits that we talked about. Now, Bill mentioned earlier that he's done a bunch of observing, right? Observed it on a bunch of different levels, recounts, election day in the polling place, um, during, during audits. <clears throat> and he noticed what we have known at the state for a very long time is that elections are conducted slightly differently uh, across jurisdictions. Uh, that's the beauty of kind of a bottom-up home rule type system that we have here. Uh, but it also, for us, is our biggest challenge, is creating that standardization. So that anyone that walks into a polling place here uh, is having the same experience as someone who walks into a polling place in Milwaukee, or someone who walks into a polling place up in the North Woods. So that's why we were so interested in exploring the process audits, and other states, including Michigan, who has uh, the second most decentralized system in the country, has a, a, a program in place that does just that. So not only are they checking on the tabulation, the results, they're checking to make sure that the clerk did things like posted the notices correctly so that citizens understand what's on the ballot, what's going to be up for election, um, trained their poll workers appropriately, um, uh, administered uh, the counting of the ballots at the end of the night effectively, uh, canvassed their results correctly. Uh, so the process audit is a whole, kind of more of a holistic program that looks at you know the everything from the first step of, of starting the election process to the last thing that's done, which is essentially storing of uh, election-related materials so that uh, our local election officials can honor public records requests. So that to our, uh, on our end, is something that's really intriguing to us because it's going to hopefully a, pro a program like that would create that standardized voting experience to make sure that all the, all the rules are being uh, applied uniformly across jurisdictions. Uh, as, we, as, as Megan mentioned, we have everything from Menominee County with 4,000 voters to Milwaukee County with over a million. There's a great deal of a diversity in that model, and what we want to do is uh, try to create that situation where everyone is having as close to a uniform experience as possible. So this is kind of uh, the second prong is the statewide voter registration system. Um, and this is kind of the core of what we want to make sure that we talk about today um, is, again, that, that system that runs elections here in Wisconsin. Uh, so the statewide voter registration system, this is something that each state is required to have, uh, but the scale of the system itself can really vary uh, depending on the state. Uh, here in Wisconsin, we have what I'd consider one of the most robust uh, election registration systems uh, in the country. And again, it really does run the behind the scenes of elections uh, from start to finish. Uh, so it starts again with those candidates filing nomination papers. Uh, it also has voter registration. Uh, that's where absentee ballots are issued. That's where the poll books are created. That's where voter participation is recorded after an election. Um, the myvote.wi.gov website pulls all of its information uh, from the statewide system. Uh, and so really it's kind of the, the heart of elections here in Wisconsin. 
A big difference of our system compared to other states is that we actually built it in-house at the State Elections Commission. Uh, most of the other states, they utilize a vendor um, to create and maintain uh, this type of system for use. Uh, but here we actually have dedicated election staff, election security staff, uh, IT staff, business staff uh, who support and maintain and built uh, this system as well. And this is important for us because we have such a unique structure here in Wisconsin. So because we have those 1,853 municipal clerks, uh, all those clerks and their staff have to have access to the system. Uh, so we have about 3,000 users of our statewide voter registration system, which again is very different than other states that might have up to maybe 100 users of their statewide system. We have 3,000. Um, and so we need to make sure that we develop and maintain a system uh, that's agile, uh, that we're able to make changes to quickly when the laws change, when the needs of our clerks change, um, or when things like the security landscape changes, uh, we actually have the control to make those changes ourselves. I want to emphasize another point, too. The bit about building it in-house in Wisconsin, Again, there's probably three or four main commercial voting registration systems that other states use. Now imagine you're sitting over in China trying to hack a system. You can get to know those three or four commercial systems and get into all the other states. You hit Wisconsin and you say, what is this? I've never seen this before. <laughs> that, that building our own system is a, is a serious security precaution that really works in our favor. So I just wanted to emphasize. Thanks. Yeah, it, you know, it, it's certainly a unique, unique system uh, to our state, and again, it gives us the most control over being able to make changes. Uh, we know who owns the system. We know who's making changes in the system. We have logs of every single move that's ever been made. Uh, we can flag anomalies in a way that would be very difficult to do if it wasn't our own homegrown system. Okay. So we also do a lot of assessments on that system. So building the system is one thing, uh, but we need to make sure that we're constantly remaining vigilant in protecting that system and analyzing it to make sure uh, that there aren't any vulnerabilities or opportunities for people to be able to access that. And I don't think it would be wise for us to try to do that ourselves. We need a lot of eyes on the system um, and a lot of partners to help us look at our system from all the different angles. Uh, so we really do utilize our state and our federal partners uh, to make sure that we're doing all the risk and vulnerability assessments on the system that we possibly can. Um, so elections was actually declared as critical infrastructure um, in 2017 and this allowed us access uh, to a lot of federal resources just like other critical infrastructure um, uh, sectors, things like utilities or transportation, elections is also given that priority. Um, so we work really closely with the Department of Homeland Security uh, to make sure that they come in and do assessments on our system. Uh, so on an ongoing basis, we work with them to have some really smart people uh, take a look at our systems and make sure that we don't have any vulnerabilities um, or there's nothing sitting dormant on our system that could come alive on election day. Uh, we have those assist, uh, assessments going on constantly uh, to make sure that we really understand our statewide system uh, from all angles. Uh, we also work with some other federal partners. Uh, there's something called the ISACs. So this is a multi-state information sharing uh, consortium uh, amongst all the states and uh, state and private partners where they share uh, technology threat information. And so elections was given its own ISAC uh, so that we could share information across the public and private sector uh, to make sure that anytime there's a patch or a vulnerability or a threat or a virus, we all know about it and we can prepare our systems uh, to block that and learn from our other state and federal partners. Um, we also work really closely with our actual Department of Administration at the state. Uh, so we build our own applications and maintain them at the State Elections Commission, but those systems are then housed on the Division of Enterprise Technology uh, through the state's division, our Department of um, Administration on their actual servers. And that's a really big benefit to our system too uh, because it allows us these enterprise level uh, protections on the actual servers themselves. Um, and so we're able to do all those protections on the actual application, but then we benefit from having that entire enterprise that protects uh, the state of Wisconsin servers um, protect elections here in Wisconsin too. And another thing that we do at the state is we do things like change freezes across the entire state. Uh, so leading up to an election, 
other state agencies that use the servers that we use or use that state enterprise structure, nobody can make changes to their system leading up to an election because we don't want to inadvertently impact an elections application. And so again, that's through those really forged partnerships that we have with other state agencies uh, so that we're all working together to protect elections. Uh, we also work with some of our state partners to do, again, some more of that penetration and vulnerability assessments um, on our systems to make sure that from the server angle, we're looking at our systems to make sure there aren't vulnerabilities as well. We have a lot of really strong uh, intelligence partners here in the state of Wisconsin, too. Uh, so we work with DOJ, the FBI, Homeland Security, the National Guard. They all have cyber teams uh, that can give us the intelligence information that we need. And we're constantly taking in information from them to make our system stronger. Um, and then at uh, the Elections Commission itself, we also have people that do that vulnerability assessment on the system too. And that's really important because these are people that know the system inside and out. So again, looking at the system from a completely different vantage point uh, than some of these other partners. And again, just real quick aside, yeah, everything you said about the registration system is true. The tabulation system is under the control of the voting machine vendors. ESNS counts 80% of the votes in this state. One vendor counts 80% of the votes in this state. We, ha you have no control over their internal security processes. They don't cooperate with Congress or DHS. Uh, Congress is working on that. But everything, all that good stuff she just explained, that protects our voter registration. It does not protect our tabulation. Okay. So a few things that we've done to protect that statewide system. So we talked about all the assessments we do, uh, but when I talked about that new HAVA security funding um, and the things that we did prior to the November 2018 election, these are some of the big highlights of the things that we were able to accomplish. One was implementing what we call multi-factor authentication in the statewide system. Um, so multi-factor authentication is probably something you're familiar with. Um, if you use online banking, a lot of times you're asked to give a username and a password, and then they'll send you another code through text or email uh, that you have to enter so that they know it's you. Uh, that's the kind of thing that we did with our statewide system. That way, if one of our 3,000 users of this, the, the statewide system, if their credentials were to be breached, let's say a, a clerk left a post post-it note with their username on their pa and their password on their computer. Somebody still wouldn't be able to, to actually access the system as that user without the other factor that we were able to provide to them. Um, and this has been something that has just been paramount to really securing our statewide system. Uh, I was just at a meeting with Homeland Security where they discussed what we had done here uh, in Wisconsin with getting 3,000 users of our statewide system on multi-factor authentication. And they described it as impossible, um, but it was something that we were able to accomplish before 2018 because we felt like it was that important. Um, we also have a lot of segregated permissions within our statewide system. And again, this is if somebody were to, let's say, get some township clerk's uh, credentials to get into the statewide system, if they were able to do that, I think it's very unlikely, but the risk would be very mitigated uh, because each permission is segregated within the system so that you can't access the rest of the system. You would only have very limited uh, mitigated access uh, if there were some kind of a breach. Uh, we also have a lot of duplication and recovery uh, built into our system. Um, so if something were to happen uh, to our system, we would be able to revert to a duplicate, a backup, uh, and we would be able to recover the system if we needed to. We also do resiliency testing uh, as part of the testing that we do as well to make sure that we're prepared uh, for a bad day and we're prepared to recover our, our system if we would ever need to do that. Uh, we also have air gaps in place in our system. Uh, and what that means is if we import or export data, let's say between other state agencies or other partners whose data we share, uh, we do not import that directly into our system. And that's really important uh, because that would just be creating sort of a, a tunnel and a vulnerability into the system. And so what we do is we air gap that, uh, so we get that information, but we make sure that the information is good before we then put it into our system. Uh, we also have dedicated election security staff. Uh, so again, when we got those Help America Vote Act uh, funds, we hired six security-specific staff uh, for our agency that help us accomplish all of this. Because uh, this is a big system to maintain and secure, and we need the staff that's dedicated to making sure that they have the expertise uh, in order to do all of this. 
We also have activity, activity logs uh, built within the system. So again, because it's our system, we know every move that has been made in it. Uh, if somebody had unlawful access to our system, we could see the log and we could see the moves that they had made in order to remedy and mitigate that situation. And so that's a really important thing as well, uh, to know what's a normal thing in our system, what's normal activity, and to be able to flag unusual activity uh, so that we can put a stop to it if that were to happen. Uh, we also have a really strict user policy and confidentiality agreement for those 3,000 users. Um, so as I'll talk about with our training, uh, we require that all the users of our system have some baseline training of cybersecurity best practices um, and that they understand the responsibility they have as custodians of their voters' personally identifiable information. Um, that's incredibly important information that they're the custodians of, that we're the custodians of, and we need to make sure that people understand the responsibility uh, that comes along with that important information. Yes? From your third party uh, vendors for hacking, what's your, uh, what's your average health scores compared to other systems in total or other election systems? Sure. In other words, how many times do they find a vulnerability on you? So that's not how the assessments work. They're ongoing, uh, sustained assessments, and they're never measuring other systems against one another because, again, our system is completely unique. Uh, there's no Apple to compare our Apple against. Um, and so uh, what we do is we're just ongoingly working with those partners to make sure that from day to day we understand the landscape. Um, so there's never a score assigned to us or a comp comparison assigned to us. It's an ongoing assessment so we can work together to make things robust. All right. Um, oh, yes, please. Hi. You mentioned some outside uh, entity tabulates the ballots. Is this right? Is that what you said? Well, she, she's going through the re registration system right now, which is a separate system. But yeah, the um, tabulation system, we can get more into the tabulation system maybe in questions and answers. Okay. That's where we've got the outside vendors operating. Yeah. This is all Wisconsin, the registration system. Yep. Okay. So talk about that later. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so because our statewide system is, again, ours and we built it, we're able to actually integrate it with all of our other election technology, with the exception of the tabulation piece, which is the, the vendor, the actual voting equipment. All the other things that are used to run elections, we've built those two. Uh, so for example, the electronic poll books um, that are in use in some municipalities around the state. Um, so some of you might have paper poll books probably at your, your polling place. Well, some municipalities have begun to adopt an electronic poll book uh, where a voter can register to vote, um, they can sign to receive their ballot, um, and we actually developed that application, again, as an integrated piece of our statewide system. Um, and this is good. Hey, Joe, yes. Has anyone used an e-poll book yet? Oh, okay, so free in the and so that program is growing. It's something that we built and launched in 2018. And so uh, municipalities are just now starting to sign on to that program and utilize uh, that technology as well. But it really does uh, provide a efficiency to both voters and to the clerks as well. Um, so when things like election day registrations happen, uh, the voter is entering that information, the clerk is entering that information right into the electronic poll book, and we can then import that data into the statewide system. This avoids errors, and it makes things easier to match, and it makes the data overall much better and more secure. Uh, those electronic poll books, they are encrypted, uh, so if somebody were to find one or to find the data, uh, they wouldn't be able to access it because it's all encrypted and can only be accessed uh, if you have the, the code to be able to unencrypt it. Um, and it's also not connected to the the internet. Uh, so the e-poll book is not connected to the internet uh, on election day. Uh, and this means that it would be very difficult for somebody to get unauthorized access uh, to that system uh, through any kind of remote means. Uh, we use what's called a point of sale model uh, computer to actually uh, hardware for those electronic poll books. And the reason we do that is it's a model that's 
built for uh, sort of use in the public. It doesn't have a lot of ports or other ways to access that device. It makes it a little more expensive, but it also makes it a lot more secure. Um, and so again, this is something that we built and we have uh, the ability to work with our poll workers, work with our clerks, work with our voters to continue to make improvements uh, to that system. Um, usability is something that we really believe in in our office. Uh, we constantly do what we call usability studies on our technology, uh, which is where we bring in people and we watch them use it and we can make changes to it uh, based on that data that we receive and that's something that we really ingrained into the development of this electronic poll book to make sure that people are able to use it. Um, the My Vote Wisconsin website, uh, this is something that we also built uh, at the State of Wisconsin Elections Commission. And again, this is the public portal uh, into the statewide system. And uh, because we built all this technology, it's kind of a seamless process where they can all talk to each other when a clerk puts in registration information or puts in the new status of an absentee ballot, we can display that right to the My Vote site uh, because it's all integrated um, as, as one larger system. So that is the statewide voter registration system. Sorry, yeah. yeah, please. Do the legislature did the really valuable thing, same day registration at the polls. You, you heard about how good that was for voter turnout in the session previous to this one. It is a massive deterrence to anyone who wants to mess with our voter registration records. Why would you hack Wisconsin if you know that the voters could just show up in the polls and say, oh, my registration's gone? Well, re-register me four extra minutes and it and the hackers work wouldn't be worth anything and so it's it's a massive deterrence for um, tampering with our voter registration system and that's that's another good thing Wisconsin has going for it thank you and I also think you know to add to that as well uh, in Wisconsin our decentralized structure in a lot of ways can be um, a, a protection for election security too because our clerks have a, such a local connection with their voters that they serve. Uh, if something unusual happens, they're going to be able to identify that uh, in a lot of our municipalities. Uh, they're going to know if there's an unusual volume of voter registrations that are coming in, unusual absentee activity. They're going to be able to detect that because of that local connection that they have. And so as uh, big of a challenge as it can seem having 1,853 local election officials, I also think that they each have the opportunity to really be the strength of our system too. So the third prong of election security is training and public information. And I don't want to underemphasize this because I think it is incredibly important um, to all those other things that we talked about. Uh, if all of our local election officials aren't uh, trained on how to use that statewide system or how to operate technology securely, uh, none of it really matters. And if the public doesn't have confidence in the process, um, that's us really not doing our job either. And so I think these are incredibly important aspects of election security. Uh, so one of the things that we did to train our local election officials, so training 1,853 local election clerks uh, when a third of them turns over every year is really difficult, uh, especially when a lot of them don't have the technology resources that they need. Uh, we have some of our local election officials that maybe their township has decided that buying them a computer isn't an expense they want to undertake, and so the clerk has to use their home computer or maybe go down to the library to do their work. Um, that's not ideal, right, for how we want to run elections, but that's where we're at. That's where some of our townships are at. So we have to understand uh, where our clerks are and try to meet them where they are to bridge some of those gaps. And so we actually built in uh, a training requirement into the statewide voter registration system. So if a new clerk wants to get access to the statewide system, First, they have to complete six interactive training modules uh, that teach them about cybersecurity best practices. Uh, and they have to do those before we'll even give them a username and password. And these just go over the basics. Things like phishing, how to detect a phishing email. And they're interactive, so the clerk actually has to do some exercises to identify those things. We teach them about browsing safely, how to just secure their technology. Um, overall security awareness, uh, things like password protocols, making sure they understand how to develop and maintain a strong password. And so they have to go through all of these, again, before we'll even give them credentials. And we actually just won an award um, from the US Election Assistance Commission for this training protocol um, because, again, it's built right into that statewide system uh, so we can track compliance and make sure that all of our clerks at least have that baseline understanding of cybersecurity. 
Uh, we also have a learning center where our clerks can go to get training on all sorts of election topics. Uh, so whether it's some of our election administration topics like voter registration, setting up a polling place, or if it's some of the specifics about how to use the statewide system, we have hundreds of online training tutorials available for our clerks. And again, we developed this knowing that most of our clerks are part-time uh, or in a small township where they might have to do some of this training after hours. And so we wanted to meet them where they are uh, to make sure that they always have access to that training uh, so that they know how to use the system and they know how to use it securely. Uh, we also do some in-person training as well. Um, so the clerks are broken up into about 12 uh, regions around the states where they have conferences. And we'll go to all those conferences and talk to them uh, about elections administration and election security as well. Tabletop exercise training. So this is something that's been new to us in our agency since election security became such a critical thing. So I just talked about how we go around to the clerk conferences and talk to them about important topics. Well, when election security first sort of came into our realm, uh, we were going to those clerk conferences. We were talking to them about cybersecurity. And it took about 10 seconds, and their eyes would glaze over, and they didn't understand how anything we were talking to them about pertain to them. And so we very quickly realized that we needed to adopt a completely different approach uh, to how we were giving that message to them. Uh, so we worked to develop a tabletop training exercise, uh, which is a scenario-based training uh, that we conduct with the clerks where we simulate election day. And everybody's assigned a role. And we have a big time clock uh, that shows election day at about 15 times the speed. And then throughout the day, they get various scenarios thrown at them that they have to work through uh, in order to solve those problems. Um, and we have done a train the trainer type model with those where we've brought in clerks from around the state, taught them how to conduct these trainings, and they're now conducting those trainings around the state with, with clerks in their regions. Uh, so before the November 2018 election, we were able to get over a thousand of our municipal clerks to participate in one of these trainings, and it's something that we're continuing to develop uh, as we head into 2020. I think that this is going to be a really important training uh, for our clerks that they should have ongoing access to. I don't think it should be a one-time thing. I think it needs to be an established part of sort of the training that's available to them. Uh, so we're trying to figure out how to make this a sustained effort around the state so that our clerks can constantly get training on this. Uh, one of the, the things I remind myself about when it comes to election security is there's no finish line, uh, there's no end date. Every single day, the threats in the landscape are going to completely change when it comes to election security. Uh, the tools that we're using to protect elections today are going to be completely different than the tools we're going to use to protect elections a year from now. And so we need a program uh, that our clerks can continually get that information, that fresh information, uh, and engage in that program as well. Okay. Uh, we also do those events uh, with our state and our federal partners too, and these have been really great exercises to make sure that we all understand at the state and federal level how to communicate to each other if there is some kind of cyber emergency or event that does take place uh, at the state, national, or local level. And so it's something, again, that we do on an ongoing basis uh, to make sure that we're addressing everyone's needs. Public information. Um, so just real quickly, I think that this is also a really core responsibility of ours when it comes to election security, and that's making sure that the public knows where to turn to for official information on elections. Um, and so I think a big part of what we want to do as we head into 2020 is continue to establish ourselves as the legitimate source of information when it comes to election security. Uh, there might be a lot of mis and disinformation floating out there for voters, and we want to make sure that people know where to go to if they want the accurate information on elections. And so that's something we all need, always need to be looking at to build uh, sort of that capacity. We're also working on some outreach toolkits specifically for election security. Uh, so we have toolkits for clerks and voter groups to use uh, when it comes to photo ID and other election administration topics. I think it's just as important that we have toolkits like that for election security. Uh, so we can work with all of our partners uh, that focus on elections to help us um, sort of be ambassadors about election security and what we're doing here in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, so that's also a part of what we're working on as we head into 2020. 
Um, and then also letting the public know about opportunities to observe the process. And it sounds like you're going to talk about that next, but there are a lot of places in elections where you can go observe uh, what's happening. So those audits we talked about, those are all publicly available uh, meetings that you can go and attend. Uh, the canvas processes, you can attend those as well. Uh, when it comes to things like counting central count absentees, uh, so we talk, somebody asked the question about how do we know that a clerk um, is counting all the absentee ballots and we don't find them later. Later, you can actually go watch that process. Uh, so in a city like Milwaukee, they count all their absentees in one central location, and members of both parties, observers, everybody's there to watch that process. And so if somebody has a question about how that happens, that's something they can always go observe as well. And then of course, the polling place on election day. Uh, that's open to observers as well, um, to make sure that you, you have confidence in sort of how that process is unfolding, and let people know if there is some type of an issue. Uh, at the Elections Commission, a lot of what we do on election day is sort of serve as a call center. We're getting information in from all around the state, from observers, from clerks, from voters, and we're working to make sure that we can remedy those situations uh, in real time. So um, that's kind of election security in a nutshell when it comes to Wisconsin elections. Uh, there is a lot to cover, so I know that was sort of a, a brief overview, uh, but I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have. I don't have a question, but I just want to say I was involved in um, 2018 um, as a part of a local activist group to get out the vote by doing registration. And the My Vote um, database, we, pre we registered people at the county fair, at the library, at the vets fair. It was very easy to use, very helpful, and the, and the data for our table, you know, our give up, the things we could give out, very available from that database. It's really an excellent tool for citizens. Well, thank you. We, we appreciate that. And, you know, I think that was one of the success stories of us using the usability process. Uh, we involved voters and uh, people, you know, in that process to make sure that it really worked for uh, the people that were going to be using it. So I'm glad to hear that. It was a law passed in 2016 that mandated the state of Wisconsin join what's called ERIC. And ERIC uh, is something required by law uh, where we compare the voter list to the DMV's list and try to identify who has moved. Um, so in early 2017, uh, those voters had been sent a postcard uh, saying, we think that you've moved. If you haven't, let us know. Send the postcard back. If we don't hear from you, you'll be deactivated. Um, and so uh, again, those voters could register to vote on election day, uh, but we found that some of them hadn't moved. So we developed a supplemental uh, list process uh, so that if they didn't indeed move, uh, they could still continue to get a ballot without having to re-register. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>